my, one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Samson. In fact, I think I put a little slide on there if we want to go to the next one there. This is kind of a Samson resemblance. I uh, wanted to have some way to say that I was qualified to speak on the subject. So, no, I'm just kidding there. Let's get off that slide right away. Let's go. <laughs> we want to talk about Samson today, and, and uh, we learned some important lessons, I think, by observing the kind of people that God uses to accomplish his purposes on the earth. You know, there's, there's heroes in the Bible, and then there's anti-heroes. Now, heroes are kind of like today, if we think about guys like Superman, you know, he's, he can faster than a speeding bullet and more powerful than a locomotive and all that kind of thing. And then we have anti-heroes. Anti-heroes are known because the, the enemy is kind of themselves. It's kind of the, like the Incredible Hulk. He gets so angry and then he turns that anger on himself sometimes or that kind of thing. And what you have here today with, with Samson is kind of an anti-hero. You know, he, he makes up his own theology. He, uh, he's kind of a sex addict. He's a murderer. He's a revenge artist. And yet somehow in this whole process, God uses him. Now before we get too judgmental on uh, Samson, uh, we, we begin to realize that, um, that sometimes we're, we all are a little bit like these anti-heroes, aren't we sometimes? Sometimes we're our worst own enemy. And, and even though there are always two sides to every story, sometimes the side we don't want to hear about is the, is the truthful side. I, my wife says in counseling, there's three sides to every story. There's his side, there's her side, and then there's the truth. But, uh, and then she's after the truth, of course. Maybe you heard the story about the little kid who comes in and he talks to his mommy, and he, he says, Mommy, he says, how do we get people on the earth? She said, well, sweetheart, she said, in the Bible, there's a story of Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve, God gave the power to, to create people, to, to have children, and then those children grew up and had children, and, and before long, that's how we got people on the earth. Little six-year-old Johnny, he's just amazed at that story, so he, he's not quite sure, but he goes in and he talks to his dad, and he says, Dad, how do we get people on the earth? And he said, well, Johnny, he says, I know you're only six, but I'll try to break it down for you. He said, about six million years ago, there were two cells swimming around in some primordial slime. They hooked up to an amoeba, and that turned into a fish, and that finally crawled up on the beach, and finally became a monkey, and that stood up, and that's how we got people. Johnny's eyes are just like big silver dollars, and he runs back over to his mommy, and she's, he says, Mom, you told me that we came from Adam and Eve, but Dad says we came from monkeys. How does that work? And she said, well, sweetheart, I was talking about my side of the family. I suppose there's two sides to, to every story, you know. But the issue here is, is there's, there's this kind of oneness that we have with each other. You know, I'm kind of wondering, you know, I know this is First Baptist Church, but hey, do me a favor. Uh, all of you who came maybe from a Presbyterian background, can I, can I see your hand? Okay, about three or four. How about a Lutheran background? How about Methodist? How about Catholic? Pentecostals, go ahead and raise two hands. Okay. <laughs> Okay, all right. <laughs> I'm not a Pentecostal because I, I work for a nonprofit. All right, anyway. But the, the issue here is the issue here is that we all kind of came into this church. We all had different backgrounds, but there's a oneness and there's something we share. And one of those things we share is sometimes this whole idea of being an anti hero. Sometimes we're our worst own enemy. Oh, this was Samson. Amazing kind of guy. He had a, what do we call here, if we go to the next slide there, I'll just kind of call for these one at a time if it's okay. But in Judges 13, it's page 175 in your pew Bible there, we can, we can read this together here. I think I can still see it from those. It says, in those days, a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan lived in the town of Zorah. His wife wasn't able to become pregnant, and they had no children. The angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, Even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful. You must not drink wine or any other alcoholic drink nor eat any forbidden food. You'll become pregnant and give birth to a son. And his hair must never be cut, for he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. He will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. 
boy, God had a plan here to kind of knock down the Philistine control. And he raises up this, this person called Samson, who I think he wanted to be a hero, but he became an anti-hero. He became his worst, his own worst enemy. This is a powerful story here. The first thing I want you to see here this morning, point number one is that Samson had a strong start. It was amazing here. I think those are, yeah, good there. Let's just stay on that one for a minute, and I'll call them one at a time there. Thanks so much for doing that. But, uh, you know, back in the Bible, Bar Barak, in all his reluctance, courageously faced the enemy and brought forth about victory. Gideon, another anti-hero, had a, in spite of a long list of inadequacies, became a courageous warrior and leader. Even Jephthah, wow. Illegitimate, impulsive, tough guy, but he delivered them from the Ammonite oppression. But Samson's, Samson was this person that God really wanted to use. Wow. Well, Manoah has a conversation with God about this. The angel visits. There's the sacrifice and the divine affirmation that when they, this angel came and talked to him, they wanted to uh, give a sacrifice back to him. And the angel said, no, it's not necessary. But the sacrifice kind of confirmed this divine affirmation. And the incident reinforced the identity of the one who had been speaking with them. And so Samson is born. And then Samson is called by God. A great and wonderful strong start. But, oh boy, there was a stormy survival. Number two, a stormy survival. Driven by the lust of his eye in verse 14, one day when Samson was in Timnah, one of the Philistine women caught his eye. When he returned home, he told his father and mother, a young Philistine woman in Timnah caught my eye. I want to marry her. Go get her for me. I mean, this just beats everything. This is even faster than the 90-day fiancé on television. <laughs> this is huge. I mean, he sees the gal. That's it. We're getting married. You can hear dad over there, you know, going like, maybe try one date. Maybe just go out a couple of times. You know, he, he's his worst own enemy. He's impulsive. He doesn't think through things. And yet God blesses him in spite of his rebellion. But he breaks his vow to God. One day traveling along the road, he meets up with this lion. That's kind of interesting. And, and he, he kills this lion. And then he rips open the lion, and inside the lion is a, is, is kind of a, a uh, inside that lion is kind of a carcass, you know, a, a, a unbelievable thing here. But it's, it's just amazing what goes on here. Because this, of this unbridled lust and passion, it always seems to destroy relationships. It breeds deeper rebellion and selfishness and leads to ultimate ruin. So bitter betrayal and a broken marriage. My goodness. They come to this gal. He obviously, obviously wants to marry her. and He says, entice your husband to explain a riddle that he's, that he's told the people in his father's house. And did you invite this party just to, just to make us poor? They're really upset with her. So in chapter 4 and verse 16 it says, So Samson's wife, excuse me, uh, so Samson's wife uh, in, in, this, in this 13 says, in 16 says, So Samson's wife came to him in tears and said, You don't love me. You hate me. You've given my people a riddle, but you haven't told me the answer. I haven't given the answer to, I haven't even given the answer to my father and mother replied. Why should I tell you? So she cried wherever she was with him and kept it up for the rest of the celebration. Just kept at him. At last, on the seventh day, he told her the answer because she was tormenting him with her nagging. Then she explained the riddle to the young men. Then his father went down to the woman, and Samson made a feast there, for the young men customarily did this. When they saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, Let me now propound a riddle to you. If you will indeed tell it to me within the seven days of the feast and find it out, then I will give you 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. But if you are unable to tell me, then you shall give me 30 linen wraps and 30 changes of clothes. And he said to them, Propound your riddle, that we may hear it. So he said to them, Out of the eater came something sweet, and out of the strong came something sweet. But they could not tell him the riddle in three days. Then it came about on the fourth day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband so that he will tell us the riddle, or we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us to impoverish us? Is this not so? Samson's wife wept before him, saying, You only hate me, and you do not love me. You have propounded a riddle to the sons of my people, 
and have not told it to me. And he said to her, Behold, I have not told it to my father and mother. Why should I tell you? And she wept again. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him in chapter, or verse 10, in chapter 14. And he came down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of them and took their spoil and gave them the change of clothes to those who had told the riddle. And his anger burned and he went up against his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his friend. Well, he's been betrayed. What looked good from the outside isn't always look good on the inside. Samson thought he got a head turner and he ended up with a spine greater. He thought he picked a winner, but he married a whiner. Even though Samson was God's choice, he suffered the consequences of his own choice. Betrayed by his wife, conned by the cons, controlled by rage, defrauded by his father-in-law, and betrayed by his friend. Led him to be driven by revenge. Full-blown now. Complete anti-hero. We move over to chapter 15. In verses 1 through 8 it says, But after a while in the time of the wheat harvest... Samson visited his wife with a young goat and said, I will go in to my wife in her room. But her father did not let him in. Her father said, I really thought that you hated her intensely, so I gave her to your companion. And, and anyway, isn't her sister more beautiful than her? He actually knew what turned Samson on. It was all about looks. This time I shall be blameless in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. Samson went and caught 300 foxes, took torches and lit up those foxes' tails. They ran through the fields and burned the entire fields down. Well, the Philistines were pretty upset. Now, God's ultimate purpose was to reduce Philistine rule over Israel. And he purposed to use Samson even though he had all the wrong motives for what he did. Revenge, rage, jealousy. He's isolated and betrayed by his own people. So he went down and he lived in the cleft of the rock of Edom. In chapter 15, verse 9, we pick up the text, and it says, Then the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and spread out in Lehi. The men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? And they said, We have come up to bind Samson in order to, to do to him what he did to us. The 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. They said to him, We have come down to bind you so that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said, Swear to me that you will not kill me. Don't let him kill me. And so they do this whole thing. And he, he gets to the point where the Philistines begin to, uh, the Philistines shouted as they met him. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him again. Even though he had been this kind of anti hero and had been this sex addict and he had been betrayed and he had done all these kinds of great things, the Spirit of the Lord still comes upon him. He breaks the ropes. His hands drop from his side to his side. He grabs a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and he kills a thousand men with it. Now, this is an amazing story. I mean, if you if you read chapters thirteen through sixteen, you kind of look at this thing with your mouth open. And then Samson said, "With the jawbone of a donkey, heap upon heaps, with the jawbone of the donkey, I've killed a thousand men." This guy's incredible. There was no gratitude by the people of Israel for the deliverance of the Philistine harassment. The people rejected Samson's help. He was left there to fight his own battles. He rejected his parents and became rejected by his own people. He was hated and hunted by his enemies and betrayed by his own people. And yet God still uses him to bring about his purposes. So if you're thinking God can't use you, relax. He can. Sometimes we're our worst own enemy. And yet God still does not take the blessing of, of, of that from us. I stand in front of you today just amazed that I get to do this. And sometimes I've been that anti-hero at times. I think we've all lived there. We've all been there. In chapter 15, verse 8, when he had finished speaking, he threw the jawbone from his hand, and he named that place Ramath Lehi. Then he became very thirsty, and he called to the Lord and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now I, I die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? But God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and the water came out of it. I mean, this is, <laughs> this is like you're walking down the street and saying, Man, I'm really thirsty, and oh, boom, there's a vending machine. Or somebody hands you a cold drink. I mean, God really worked with Samson in an unusual way. 
powerful thing here. And this was kind of the first prayer by Samson, but it was filled often with kind of sarcasm and resentment and demandedness. In spite of this attitude, God chose to supply his need. Appetites drove Samson's life. Lust carried, caused him to marry a daughter of the enemy. Can you imagine that? He even married, wanted to marry this Philistine. Hunger, he got a, kind of a sweet tooth. Caused him to violate his Nazareth vow because he reached into the dead animal and picked up that honey and ate it. You, you don't touch dead things as a Nazarite. And then he took that honey and he tried to, and he gave it to his parents, but he didn't tell them where it came from. This guy makes up his own theology. Ever been around anybody like that? <laughs> they just kind of make it up. They kind of tell, well, God will never do that, and God's this kind of gracious God, and he, he's not going to jump anybody. And, and he, we even have pastors today who say, well, you know, there really is no hell. I mean, a gracious God would never do that. And we always think that justice has to be fair. What an illusion. Because if you think that justice has to be fair all the time, you're just dealing with an economic understanding of justice. Justice has to do with God's righteousness. And his righteousness and justice never do any violence to each other. That's why he says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. You can't just take all of what you think in theology and put it into a rational thought. Because if, if all theology has to fit within your reason, you're God, not him. And so we make up our own theology. Samson was great at this. Samson completed the lust triangle, lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. There are times in our life that our attitude stinks and our motives are lousy but God still brings about his eternal purposes. And we realize that God accomplished something through us, but we grumble and complain all the way through it. We really could enjoy God's ministry in our lives, but because of our attitude, we not only lose the reward, we even lose the joy of doing it. Well, now Samson takes off and he goes down to Gaza and he sees a harlot. Uh-oh, what's her name? Delilah. Chapter 16, verses 1 says, When he was told of the Gazites saying, Samson has come here, they surrounded the place and lay in wait for him all night at the gate. They kept silent, saying, Let us wait into the morning, then we'll kill him. So Samson lay until midnight, and at midnight he rose and took hold of the doors of the gate, city gate, and, uh, and the two posts, and pulled them up along with the bars and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the mountain, which is opposite Hebron. Now, I, I don't know about you, but if some guy got up in the middle of the night and picked up the gates to the city along with the posts, threw them on his back, walked up a hill, not down a hill, up a hill, and slammed them up top, I might think twice about taking this guy's life. This guy's an amazing, amazing stud. I mean, he's just huge he's big he's bulked up wow well he meets this he meets this gal by the name of Delilah and with her many persuasions she entices him with flattering lips she seduces him and suddenly he's like an ox going to slaughter as or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool until the arrow pierces right through his liver. And so Sam, Delilah says to Samson, Be, Behold, you have deceived me. Now, the same kind of comment is coming out of Delilah as out of his first wife. You've not told me the secret of your strength. And he says, Okay, okay, okay. If you bind me tightly with new ropes which have never been used, then I'll become weak and I'll be just like any other guy. And so she does. And then she yells out later as after he's been sleeping, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And here comes these guys and they're going to they get him. But he breaks these things like they're like little toothpicks or like little, you know, just like uh, nothing. Boom, gone. And of course, 
course, the, Philist the Philistines, they flee. So then she, she gets upset, and she cries and whines and says, you didn't tell me the truth. When your heart's not with me, how do you expect me to love you? Can't you share your secrets with me? And he says, well, he tells her something else. And once again, she gets fooled. And so again, one the third time now, she's telling him, tell him. He says, okay. He says, a razor is never supposed to come on my head. For I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. And if I am shaved, my strength will leave me. So she fall, he falls asleep in her lap. Now, this is kind of an interesting part of the story because he must have been a deep sleeper because they come in and shave his head and he doesn't wake up. This is kind of interesting to me anyway. There's always a little bit of humor in the text, you know what I'm saying? So anyway, his head is shaved and then she says, the Philistines are upon you. And he gets up pre prepared to take, to take charge again and he's now he's as weak as a little, just as weak as a little baby. And the Philistines capture him. They take him. They bind him up. They poke both of his eyes out. And he's completely blind. But we're going to see that even though Samson is blind, for the first time in his life, he's going to see spiritually. Perfectly. Sometimes God has to bring us down a peg or two so we can see and hear correctly. More than anything else, God wants you to see him and he wants you to hear him correctly. Well, there comes a point when God chose to remove his blessing, and now he did. Because we can grieve and we can quench the Spirit. We can fall short of God's grace for the moment and resist it and not appreciate it. We can be disqualified for ministry, and Paul disciplined his body to avoid qualifications. We can desert the ministry as Demas did, having loved this present world. We can reject a good conscience and suffer shipwreck. We can ignore the warnings not to drift, doubt, default, defect, despise, and suffer greater and greater discipline of the Lord. We can even sin unto death. Samson had crossed the line. Samson ignored God's call and his special mark on his life and followed his own way too long and lost everything. Then the Philistines, they seized him. They took care of his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze chains, and he was a, was a grinder in the prison. But what they forgot in chapter 16, verses 4 through 22, his hair began to grow. See, this would have been a good thing for those guys to make sure that Samson got a haircut every week. But they didn't do that. Why? Because they were just partying too much. How ironic that Samson lost some of the very things he misused for selfish purpose. He lost his eyes, he lost his freedom, he lost his strength, and he lost the manifested presence of God. And maybe some of you might have felt like that from time to time. We've got to be very careful how we use the gifts of God. Whether it be of financial resources, physical strength, beauty, talent, hormones, appetites, time, freedom, it doesn't matter. Use it unto the glory of God. Because there are temporal consequences for bad choices. Even though we may be used by God, the choices we make still have consequences. Remember, the penalty for sin was paid, not the consequences for sin. Do not be deceived, Galatians 6 says. God's not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this will he also reap. Well, God responds to faith. And Sam, Samson had a thrilling beginning. A turbulent, self-indulgent life which led him to a shocking, premature end in sentence. And so we come now to that final point of a shocking sentence. Well, the lords of the Philistines assembled to offer great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice, for they said, Our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hands. And when people saw him, they praised their God. They said, Our God has given our enemy into our hands, even the destroyer of our country, who has slain many of us. I mean, you can imagine the party that's going on here. The text reads in Judges 16, verses 23 through 27, And so it happened that they were in high spirits. They said, Call for Samson that he might amuse us. So they called for Samson. This is amazing. 
from the prison and he entertained them. And they made him stand between the pillars. Then Samson said to the boy who was holding his hand, Let me now feel the pillars on, on which the house rests, that I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. About 3,000 men and women were on the roof looking as Samson was amusing them. Verse 28, Samson calls to the Lord, Almighty God, please remember me. Please strengthen me just this one more time, O oh God that I might avenge the Philistines for my two eyes. And probably for the first time, Samson prays with genuine humility, recognizes his own helplessness and hopelessness apart from God. He was blind physically, but he saw very clearly spiritually. Humility is the soil in which genuine faith grows. God resists the proud, but he grants come grace to the humble, and this was Samson's defining moment. Unbelievable moment. You know, he even gets some ink in Hebrews 11 in the Hall of Faith, along with Barak, Gideon, Jebeth, Death, David, and Samuel. Faith believes God to do powerfully what he promises and that we cannot possibly do ourselves. So Samson grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested, braced himself against them, the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. What an anti-hero. A victim of his own doing. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the lords and the people who were in it. So the dead whom he killed at his death were more than he had killed during his life. What a shocking sentence to such a strong start. Samson traded a vital relationship with God for the temporal sensuality with women. His life was driven by personal revenge rather than national redemption. His life was full of unhappy consequences and as a result of unwise choices and unbridled lust. He defied his parents. He had a broken marriage, responsible for wife and family's death, married outside the faith, pettiness, betrayal, vengeance, anger, isolation. He was hunted, lonely, rejected by his own, lost his eyes, his freedom, and his self-respect. Wow! <laughs> How you doing so far, gang? And yet God used him. Someone once said that one of the things over which we will grieve the most is when we see the whole picture of what we were in the light of what we could have been had we really fully surrendered to God. D.L. Moody said it this way, great pastor and preacher of Chicago, Illinois, we've yet to see what God can do with a man who is fully surrendered to him. Samson judged Israel for 20 years, none of which were years of much rest. But rest comes when we trust and obey. And Samson didn't either until the very end. And since the deliverance was incomplete, so was Israel's relief from Phil the Philistines. It was restrained for the moment, but it continued for years to come. Well, there's some lessons to live by here. Godly heritage does not guarantee godly living, does it? Even though Manoah and his wife were godly parents, it doesn't mean the kids are going to be that way. Trust and obedience is a daily individual choice. Everyone is responsible for their own relationship with God. God uses us because of his choice and his grace, not because of our greatness. We must continually remember that just because we had devotions or gave money in the offering or did some good deed that God can use us more. That's not true. Because the reality is that he can use donkeys to bring about his purposes. He can call rocks out to praise him and proclaim if he has to. If you feel more usable because of some work you did, you don't get grace. So don't think you're so great that God has to use you to do great things. 
He just uses people who are wholly surrendered to him in humility. Now, you may be struggling today and wondering if God can ever use you again. I can guarantee that he can. God, in his marvelous grace, can and uses unlikely people, even sometimes in the, in the, in the light of our own poor choices. Sometimes when we're acting like an anti-hero, God can still use us. You can exercise faith today. You can come in humility today and offer yourself to God as a living sacrifice. Earlier I asked how many people have come from different backgrounds. The truth be said, if we went through everything, we could probably find a whole bunch of things we could find here about ourselves. We come from all kinds of various backgrounds. But today we're sitting here in Golden together. United by one thing, not denominational standards. We're here today united by one and only one thing, the grace of God made known through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's it. It's pretty simple. And the purpose is to continually seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Solomon experienced a similar conclusion as Samson. He tried to fill every void in his life and found it to be a vapor, vanity, and meaningless. In Ecclesiastes 12.1, he wrote some amazing advice to young people. Remember also the Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. People ask me now, at my age, and I'm 76, people ask me, What's the most important thing to you? Well, besides my wife of 45 years, my two adult children, those grandkids are pretty special. To sit there with them on your lap and reading them a story and talking about the things that are going to make their lives important, to encourage them in their educational pursuits, and even to say very humbly and very gratefully and say, sure, thank God for the fact that he's given you such great, great talents. You have a great mind. You have a great intellect. You're headed for some great careers. But remember, there's more than that. There is that personal walk with God, which nothing in this world can fill. But the joy of knowing Christ Savior. Not just as your Savior, but as your personal friend. Unbridled passion always hinders ministry. Bondage to the flesh leads to bondage to the enemy. A couple weeks ago, Pastor Lynn was at our Bible study on Thursday, and he mentioned a book he had read, and one of the, one of the things that the author had said in spiritual leadership for every pastor, there's three things you don't touch. They all started with the word G. You don't touch the gold, which means leave the money alone. You don't touch the girls, very good idea. And you don't touch the glory. God always leaves the glory to himself. You don't touch the gold. You don't touch the girls. You don't touch the glory. Samson touched all three. And God still used him. I hope that all of you are heroes. I hope that only at times you act once in a while like an anti-hero. But be assured of this, God is not through with you yet. He's never through with your life. There's always room to come back to him. John puts it this way in his first book of John, chapter 2, verse 15. Don't love the world and the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but it's from the world. The world's passing away, and also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Jesus put it this way, cheer up, I've overcome the world. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Amen. And amen. Let's pray. Lord, thanks again for the life of Samson.
what a powerful, unique individual he really was. This morning as we come to you and as we turn to you, we think of ourselves as well. Thank you that you're never through with us. You don't throw us away like a rag doll. You desire more than anything else that we are empowered by you to do your will. I know there are times where we have these strobe light periods of alternating life and light and darkness in our life at times. But Lord, help us this morning, even before we walk out of this auditorium, even before it hits 11 o'clock this morning, that we might once again resubmit our life to you and say, Lord, I turn from that back to you. Use me again as your light. Make me the salt that you want me to be. Make me effective in the community that I live. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. At this point in the service, we'll be uh, taking our offering, so ushers, if you would uh, get ready. Uh, next week is our uh, annual business meeting. and.